Sweeney last February, just after the dictator Baby Doc Duvalier fled the country. But what these familiar scenes did not reveal was the extent to which the passions and anger of the Haitian people were focused not just on the dictator, but also on his wife, Michelle Bennett Duvalier. What? Oh, but She's a bum. Michelle Bennett, she's a prostitute. She made very good example, and all the time she did marijuana. But they're earning money, millions and millions of dollars. Michelle Bennett, everybody call her a lesbian. She tried to, to eat all, all the TV and children. She was sacrificed. That's what she did. Like. sacrifice. No charge about the former first lady seemed too extreme. Throughout the country, chants and lurid songs about Michelle's sex life rang out on the streets. Graffiti and crude drawings appeared on walls. The body of this Tonton Makut, a hated Duvalier security policeman, was roasted and paraded through the streets of the capital. When we talked to the people who murdered him, they told us that Michelle Duvalier had ordered the man to poison the water supply of the capital and that they had killed him before he could carry out her order. Who told the Marco to do that? Who is the Marco to do that? Michel Bennett. Michel Bennett. But how did it happen that this one woman could have so mobilized the fury of a nation? The story begins five years ago in a moment of seeming innocence. June 5, 1980, in a ceremony so lavish that the Guinness Book of Records lists it as one of the three most expensive weddings, Haiti's 28-year-old president for life, Jean-Claude Duvalier, marries Michelle Bennett, a divorcee and mother of two. If it looked to the world like a grotesque demonstration of extravagance in the poorest country in the hemisphere, the most Haitians watching on television, it was enchanting. A storybook wedding of a king and a queen. They liked her. They liked the queen. They went to the queen. They had a queen. Is that the way she saw herself as a queen? I don't think she saw herself as anything less than that. Bernard Saint-Journet, one of Haiti's leading painters, was a favorite artist and frequent dinner guest of Baby Doc and Michelle. And she suited the role because uh, she was the first person in those 30 years to understand that show business was the name of the business. And her show business was very well written. As First Lady, Michelle immediately enlisted Haiti's TV network to promote herself as a champion of the poor and to solicit contributions for her Michelle Bennett Duvalier Foundation. Every day, the elegant First Lady was featured in scenes like this, launching vaccination campaigns, touring hospitals, giving a heart to the people. It was a powerful image that won over even such a symbol of saintliness as Mother Teresa. I've seen many people coming, and kings and people, presidents and prime ministers, but I have never seen the poor people being so familiar with their heads of state as they were with her. It was a beautiful lesson for me. I have learned something from you. So, thank you. And she was capable of showing that she could be the very best, and in reality, she displayed that she was the very worst. Joe Manfi, the brother of the new leader of Haiti, businessman and perennial insider, he explained that an altogether different First Lady was surfacing inside the palace. She took over literally this country and within one year she had kicked out of the palace Jean-Claude's mother. All of Jean-Claude's mother's relatives, 98 of them, were exiled. So she literally went after the, 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 the Duvaliers with a, with a vengeance, I mean, to, to literally exert her power. As president for life, Baby Doc, with his private army of thugs, the Tonton Maku, ruled Haiti with unchecked brutality. But by all accounts, he was always dominated by his sister and mother. And once Michelle purged them from the palace, she emerged as the unrivaled force behind the throne. He was dumb, because when Michelle was speaking, uh, and she, w she, w she would shut him up. Yes, she would shut him up. Uh, in the cabin meeting? Oh, uh, well, she answered anybody at any time. Nobody could resist that. 
Omar Jolicoeur, Haiti's omnipresent journalist and gossip columnist, and recently appointed Secretary of State for Information. Were people afraid of her? I beg your pardon. She, was, she frightened everybody. And people avoided her because try to avoid her because if she doesn't get what she wants, she would cry, she would try to break everything, she, was hyster she would go ex hysterical. The system of government that Michelle came to influence so deeply was rooted in corruption. And as First Lady, she demanded a piece of the action for herself and her family. Almost overnight, her father, Ernest Bennett, who was reportedly on the verge of bankruptcy, became a wealthy man. With his daughter in the palace, he paid no export taxes and soon cornered much of the coffee trade. But this was all just a part of the official corruption that had become a way of life in Haiti. The majority of the country's 7 million citizens earn less than $150 a year. And for more than a quarter of a century, the Duvaliers used their power to extort nickels and dimes from every transaction carried out by these desperately poor people. Even U.S. aid shipments were often diverted and sold for profit in the marketplace. By the time of his marriage to Michelle, Baby Doc is said to have amassed a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. You are simply not interested in running a country in a normal way. What was he interested in? Money, money, and money. What about his wife? What was your impression of her? She was even more greedy than he was himself, because she had to catch up, you see. When Marc Bazin became Haiti's finance minister in 1982, he quickly became suspect by questioning the national budget, 30% of which he says went directly to Baby Doc and Michelle. So $60 million went for his and her personal use? Absolutely. Every year? Oh, yes. And that was just official open corruption because it was coming out of the budget. But what about the First Lady's foundation? and the millions of dollars she had raised on behalf of the poor. That was just a cover. Just a cover. Was she taking a lot of money out of it, you think? Oh, yes, yes. I believe that was a very important source of income for her. This scene came to symbolize the blind arrogance of Baby Doc and Michelle's regime. The dictator hurling small change to the poor, while he and his wife extorted hundreds of millions. Michelle came into the government through the bedroom and she brought down the government in five years through her greed. Since the 1960s, when he was condemned to death by Papa Doc, Ray Joseph, the editor of the Brooklyn-based newspaper, The Haiti Observateur, has chronicled the Haitian Revolution. He points to the Pope's visit in March 1983 as the first challenge to Baby Doc and Michelle. The Pope was going beyond the Duvaliers, standing by him, and telling the Haitian people, I don't agree with what they're doing. We cannot have this scandalous wealth side by side with the abject poverty. Things have got to change. And from that speech of the Pope, uh, the message went out that uh, the Duvali regime could no longer continue the way it was continuing, it was doing business. Most every revolution has an event that finally triggers a people to action. Unlikely as it may seem, the incident in Haiti was a television broadcast, shown in squares like this across the country on TVs, which the First Lady had had installed to show her good works. And what the people of Haiti saw in May of 1984 was this lavish benefit ball, which Michelle had organized on behalf of the poor. Tell me about that $500 plate dinner. What was it like? Let's say Nero came back and gave a party in 1985 in Haiti. It was Nero. It was the... the, the it was... It, it, it was... Incredible, it was incredible. The, the champagne that was being offered. And that night they didn't give champagne, they gave croup. Very expensive. Most goddamn expensive.
person something in the world. Maybe he had never seen anything like it. Ministers' wives dressed in Parisian gowns, a jeweler flown in from Paris to present a $30,000 necklace as a draw prize. I watched this and I said to myself, I wonder how they never understood what they were doing to themselves. What, what, what do you mean? What were they doing to themselves? Well, this party was broadcast live over Television Nationale, the government television. So when people watch this ball, I mean, wasn't this a benefit to raise money? For it sure? was a benefit to raise money. But the clash of that luxury, that display of wealth versus their poverty situation was just too much for anyone to digest. <laughs> the reaction here in Gonaive, where people still respond with fury at the memory of that party, was to launch the first demonstration in the history of the Duvalier regime. They protested their hunger and called for the end of the dictatorship. But it wasn't until the following year that Michel provided a second spark. This one destined to change the country forever. It came six months ago, at a time when Haiti was on the verge of bankruptcy, unable even to buy fuel for its trucks and buses, and facing food shortages. It was just at this moment that Michelle and an entourage of 14 set off on a fateful shopping trip to Paris. And for the first time, people got very angry because Michelle spent a f a one million for one week and then asked for a second million from the govern governor of the central bank, and she got it. And uh, we understand that she spent $1.7 million. On what? On clothes, on paintings, on fair coats, and also refrigerator for the fair coats. A refrigerator for, for the fur coats? Yes, freezers. Did, did you hear what happened when Michelle went back to Haiti? Uh, with all these furs that she bought abroad. That's not the first time she's bought furs. Uh, she has special parties for her friends who also have furs. And Haiti is a tropical country. So at that point, they turn on a special room, very cold, They're like a freezer, really, so they can put on their furs. That actually happens. In the palace? In the palace. Is it really possible that a a shopping spree could have ignited a revolution? Uh, the shopping spree was the spark. And what it did was to ignite rebellions all over Haiti. A revolution was now underway. There were rumors that de Valier had ordered plane loads of Uzi submachine guns, and there was a fear that the Tonton Marcou were about to be unleashed on the demonstrators. But there were also reports that the president for life and Michelle were preparing to flee. And then, unexpectedly, just before dawn on the 7th of February, the 29-year-old Duvalier dynasty came to a close. Baby Doc and Michelle drove through a gauntlet of newsmen to a waiting U.S. Air Force jet that flew them to exile in France. They had managed to get an estimated $800 million out of the country, leaving behind less than $500,000 in the treasury. In Haiti, people's anger was reduced to acts of symbolic vengeance. But in New York, Michelle's brother was attacked in the streets, and in Paris, the Duvalier's financial advisor was beaten and hospitalized. So, so what happens now to, to Baby Doc and Michelle? They're safe in the south of France with much of the wealth of, of Haiti at their disposal? Is this where it all ends? Uh, it cannot end there.